However, I would like to turn to you, Mr. Jibali. We heard in your statement earlier on a description of the general outline of the expectations of your government. However, in Tunisia, you are also today currently redrafting your constitution. Now, I would like to know what are the principles that you, you will be upholding in your constitution, because there's a general fear. When elections take place and certain parties win the election and that are the majority in a parliament to draft a new constitution, does this mean that the constitution will allow for the peaceful transition of power, transitional government? Is this how the constitution will be drafted or will it be through consensus with the different parties? Thank you, Nadine. First of all, the constitution will not be a constitution of the parliamentary majority. How? It shall be a consensual participatory constitution with all segments of society, parties, organizations, associations, unions. You may be assured that there are many proposals uh, regarding uh, the new constitution from intellectuals, academics, uh, trade unions, and political parties. So the Constitutional Council is, does not have a majority that has agreed uh, to the terms of a given constitution. It is an agreement on a coalition. However, the constitution will be the object of an exchange of views to draft a constitution. There is a consensus in Tunisia that this constitution must respond to the expectations of all segments of Tunisian society, i.e. it must defend human rights, public freedoms, women's rights. This is a great achievement for the Tunisian people. All the segments of Tunisian society agree to these bases and have agreed to uphold them. This constitution will be one seeking to establish a civil society, a civilian state that takes into account human rights and defends economic freedoms and respects uh, religious freedom, religious worship, and faith. A constitution that provides for the peaceful transition of power and one that will prevent us from falling back into dictatorship. If there is one thing we have agreed to in Tunisia, and a large majority has agreed to that, it is the form of this constitution. As to whether we are going to be a constitutional, a parliamentarian or a presidential system, this is a point of form rather than principle. All Tunisians refuse to turn back to the past, and this constitution will be our security against this. The Tunisian people and history will not accept, I believe, even the international community will not accept for us to turn back. And though the European and international authorities have supported Ben Ali in the past, they have now learned their lesson and now they will no longer accept to deal with any dictatorial regimes. I believe that uh, there has been a very positive outlook towards the Tunisian experience because such an experience and development is in the interest of all. It is an excellent model for peaceful transition and change as compared to the violent change that has taken place in other parts of the world. This is in the interest of Tunisia, the Arabs and the world. One last point, an important point. Tackling social problems is an important point. We all know, Mr. Jibali, the current revolutions was sparked by poverty and unemployment. Your responsibility today, a major responsibility today, is to tackle these problems as well as your relations with the 
with Europe and with the, the external world. And uh, these uh, problems will uh, affect and influence your relations with the outside world. The motto and slogan of the Tunisian revolution and other Arab revolutions is dignity. Dignity, politically speaking, socially speaking, and dignity in combating political hegemony, as well as dignity socially speaking. In Tunisia, we have taken great steps towards the establishment of a democratic regime one that responds and meets a large part of the claims of the Tunisian people which has rejected dictatorship. As I said, and as my colleague said, our major concern is the social challenges. How can we now respond to that second aspect of dignity, that is to say social justice. In Tunisia, there is a major challenge here because these masses of unemployed young people have found their voice. They were silenced by the previous dictatorship. Now they demonstrate mass and even in certain cases do so beyond the law. And this has come about due to the long decades of corruption. Fortunes were stolen, were looted, generations lost their future. So we must tackle this second part of dignity. So while safeguarding democracy and freedoms and establishing the state of law and a constitution, we must nevertheless respond to the second part because we are suffering from two problems or facing two challenges, urgent social demands as well as the insecurity and state of unrest, which can improve if we improve uh, social uh, living conditions. The overall economic situation in the world is also an important factor. However, we do hope we shall be able to move on to a new phase where we will be able to tackle new problems. These problems are those of, uh, first of all, employment. We must seek to overcome, employ, uh, overcome unemployment. We must also try to convince our partners that for the Tunisian democratic experience to succeed, Tunisia and other Arab countries need support in these endeavors. I believe here in Davos, this is an opportunity for us, and after hearing this appeal, these development efforts require support. They require us to use our own resources, but these may not be sufficient. We will need further resources, and we hope we shall be able to do so without looting the resources of the other peoples. But maybe the West now needs a message, needs a reassurance from these new political parties which now rule the, a number of Arab countries. So what can you say to reassure these investors in the field of traditional banking or fisheries or in other fields? I do not believe that the new regimes must be called the political Islamist regimes. I do not believe so. But they did win the elections. It is true, but we need to be very specific when we choose our terminology. We are speaking about democratic regimes who won honest elections and transparent elections. And for the first time in the Arab world, we have elections, we have free and honest elections, which led to democratic regimes in Tunisia. And for the first time, and this is what I just said in my speech, we have a consensual government that 
comprises a number of diverse political parties. But uh, I, th I believe that the liberals also uh, may were part of your bloc. Yes, it is true. The liberals were part of our bloc. And uh, the Tunisians, uh, uh, whether they are Islamists, whether they are Jewish, who cares? They are Tunisians, and that is what counts. Uh, they are Tunisians. Uh, what is important is to have a democratic regime, is to have a democratic system that won honest elections. Some say that the Western system is not suitable, is no longer appropriate. We are for a free and open markets. We are for the freedom of capital. And I do understand that there are regional specificities, and I do understand that there are shortcomings in our countries, and that is why the state has to play a role in order to amend, to correct the situation. The state must not intervene in the economic life. This is not what we want. We do not want interventionism by the state. We want to leave the markets open and free, but the state has a certain role to play to amend the system, to supervise the economic system in order to ensure that it works to serve the interests of the citizens. We need certain reforms. We are not against the Western system per se, but we understand and we think that underprivileged populations need to be given their rights. Raghida Dargham from Al Hayat newspaper. Do you have any guarantees, any constitutional guarantees in order to separate the state from religion? You are quite vague when it comes to this matter. The situation in the Arab world is now, has now changed a lot. And women in the Arab world, what, are they, what they are calling for are guarantees. They want a new constitution that would guarantee them their rights. And you come and you say that you want to work with the West, you want assistance from the West, and it is true, it is clear to us that you want a new relationship with the West, but what do you have to offer to the West? Can you ensure the West that you are going to move forward even though you have a half democracy, if I might say, because you don't have a democracy that guarantees the right of all women? Democracy, we, do, we cannot have uh, an amputated democracy. And if we want a real democracy, then we have to take into account the entire population. The democracy cannot ignore women. For the first time in the history of my country, we had the same number of women as men on electoral lists. The, we have a large number of women in our parliament. 42% of them are from Al Mahda. This Al Nahda party, as you know, has an Islamic tendency. We do not believe that we can build a society without half of its population. Half of that population is made up of women, and women, as you know, they raise generations. So we cannot build a society without women. We have in the past said this, and I shall repeat it here again. It is true that there are certain things that take place in our country that must be denounced. It is true that the situation of Arab women is not one of the best in the world. However, I think that we are doing a lot in this field. I believe that many efforts are being made, especially in Tunisia. Women are allocated a lot of importance, and we are working hard to ensure the place that women deserve in society. I do not know what other guarantees do you want. We have a constitution that is non-discriminatory, that gives the same equal rights to men and women, to people from various creeds. These are the rights that we must guarantee because they are guaranteed in Islam and must be guaranteed in the Tunisian constitution. 